Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio. Audio. ArtPod is a South African-focused visual arts podcast hosted by Claude Chandler. Join me weekly every Saturday as I'm joined by a new guest who occupies a position within the visual arts community, ranging from fine arts, tattooing, framing, and logistics. Welcome to another episode of ArtPod. This is a slightly different format. Maybe you could call it a special episode where it's just me in studio. I'm sitting here next to an artificial fire on the screen, which makes it feel very cozy and makes me feel very wise. I would just kind of want to give a bit more context to my artistic career and maybe my process and even artistic philosophy, I guess, and kind of gives you a bit of understanding as to where I'm coming from and why I got into the podcast or what attracted me to this venture. I come from a family of artists, father and mother. So in a way, I kind of just joined the family business. There's no adventure or braveness on my side in regards of the typical artists abandoning their parents to pursue such a career. Though, however, I do remember my father, my late father, who stated that no son of mine will become an artist. And I think a big factor to that is him understanding the struggles emotionally and financially that the life of an artist brings. But however, after his passing, I think a big part of me wanted to pursue art. And I think in many ways, art was a great tool for kind of dealing with certain emotions or feelings or just kind of making sense of the world around me. I mean, my first, as I said in my first episode, I remember when I, well, I don't remember when I was six, my parents found me passed out next to a, an open jar of turpentine. I obviously I drank it and passed out and then they had my stomach pumped and the doctor said, how the hell could you let this happen? And they just said, oh, we both artists. Well, you know, we need to be a bit more aware and maybe some kind of superhero metaphor that's when my artistic journey started as a young kid at around the age of 15 i definitely had a, a huge entrepreneurial bone inside of me i started waitering i started doing odd jobs here and there and it was just to kind of afford skateboarding stuff and i was really into my computers and i think i've kind of carried that on throughout into my artistic career and I definitely think it's been a benefit in terms of having that kind of business sense when it comes to promoting my own art or help navigate the art world. Uh, I did art in school. A big project in 2005 was I started painting my teachers and I think this was just kind of um, about identity and identifying myself as an artist and making my teachers and my peers around me know that I'm serious and this is what I'm doing. And painting the portraits of my teachers really kind of affirmed that, I'm kind of showing my talent. And high school ended, I was terrified um, because I put all my eggs in one basket. I only applied to DUT, um, which is the Durban University of Technology, the fine art department. I kind of had my mind set that this is what I was going to do. And a number of my peers were either went into IT, one got a scholarship with Sassel to do electrical engineering. And yeah, I just felt I was, I was taking a big risk here. And unfortunately for me, what I felt was, not a, it was a slight sense of betrayal um, where I really wanted more and I felt very insecure about this career path and I didn't feel I got what I wanted or needed or what I thought at the time that I needed um, to pursue an art career. And even so, when I finished first year, a good friend of mine who was also very creative and very talented said, um, I just finished my trick. I also want to study far and art. What do you think, Claude? And I said, don't do it, don't you dare. I said, rather study graphic design, um, and which you did do. And then by the end of my studies, a third year came around. I had this kind of pressure of, in third year, they, you know, they wanted a, a big body of work, a thesis, or just something revolving around um, a focal point. And I just found 
at the time, I didn't have anything I felt of value to add to kind of society or to commentate on. I didn't have a big struggle or what I perceived as a struggle or an opinion to voice. And I pursued portraiture and just saw how that could kind of evolve and become a vessel for certain topics or messages. And within that time, I discovered my stamping technique. And this was actually in a gap year in between that I wasn't going to class and I failed second year. And within that gap year, I guess, while I was catching up on two of my subjects, I was working for other artists, I was working for sculptors, and I was working on my own body of work. And within that time period, I discovered the stamping technique, kind of my brand now. And there was a bit of commercial success with it. I was getting great responses from other artists and peers. So going back into third year, I just felt I was kind of prepared and ready. And I had this amazing venture to kind of bring forth to my lecturers, but they weren't really too interested. And I kind of let it die off there. I could have done another year and got my BTEC, but at the time I was kind of unhappy with the university. In large, I was also unhappy with Durban. And at the time, uh, a girl I was dating was moving to Cape town and i just thought everything makes sense i'm gonna also move to cape town and a big motivator also was i had my best friend living there who had been staying there for five years and he offered me a space um, minimal rent i mean generous amount price for the the room and i went there a big part of me was also to kind of pursue my artistic career there durban it's really hard to be an artist there's a big sense of art artists buying art and that's as generally as far as it goes and then also wanting to be anonymous you know growing up in the art scene everyone knowing me and kind of this huge expectations and being in this huge shadow i just kind of want to escape that and just start fresh and also prove I could do it on my own. I mean, even in high school with painting my teacher's portraits, there was a lot of pushback from the students and peers saying like, oh, it's just because your your mother's helping you paint, you know, you, um, you can't do it by yourself. So I always felt that kind of resistance to my work. The relationship didn't last that long. I don't recommend dropping um, or chasing girls across the country. It doesn't always pan out, but it did get me into Cape Town and I'm very happy I stayed on. Um, when I first moved here, I really wasn't sure what to do. I, I I could have waited, I just no, knew I needed to get work. And fortunately there was a company, or there is a company called Art Jamming. And they operate as a retail store, and then they also operate as a kind of painting facility, mainly targeted to children. The basis for the business is you bring your kid in, you buy a canvas, all the paint, all the brushes and an easel supplied, and you paint for two hours and then you leave with the painting. So it's almost like a kind of a painting daycare in, in some ways, but then there were also um, adult classes and team buildings and corporate events. But what it enabled me was, in a way, a painting studio and access to paints, because if there were no customers and the store was clean and everything was in order, you were allowed to work on your own work. So I took full advantage of this. And for me, it was just great, even though I was on the outskirts of the art world, I was still operating within it. And at the time I was working with my close friend Cameron, who I recommended study graphic design instead of fine art. He kind of also got me the in with the, the job. And I think it was about a year in, um, I'd been doing odd jobs, anything like painting portraits at the mall for Edgar's, um, teaching privately for young children on Gumtree looking for any kind of cartoon jobs I could get my hands on to. And it was really, it was quite tough. It was a struggle, but it was fun at the same time. I definitely really enjoyed my time at Art Jamming and I'll always be grateful for that opportunity. But around that time, my friend was offered a job at Ogilvy. He'd been applying to a number of these big um, graphic design firms or advertising firms and he got the job. And I remember having this horrible sinking feeling, just thinking, oh God, like he studied for this and now he's working for what he studied for and I kind of looked at myself and I just said is this gonna be my life and I mean I had this huge kind of 
panic and breakdown. I started smoking cigarettes again and I just kept on going at it. And then eventually I got a huge break um, with a studio, a creative collective called Studio 41, which was run by a guy called Savick. And he got this big corporate job with a solar energy farm and they were doing a big dinner and then they needed like kind of gifts or trinkets or things to give to their clients. And I put forward a Karoo landscape painting and then they said we wanted to be a bit more functional. So it ended up being a table mat. And I ended up painting 400 table mats. I kind of got a team together, did stencil work, just try to streamline it as best as I could. And with the money that came from that, I just thought I can pay for four months house rent. I can hire a studio space at Studio 41. I can get four months studio rent. Let's just make this happen. And it was a huge commitment. And I was absolutely terrified to kind of let go of the job I had, even though it only afforded me a meal, like I could only basically buy a meal a day from it. But it was still a sense of safety and security. And I took the jump. And fortunately, things just started lining up. The the first SPI portrait competition came up. This was in 2013. And for a long time, I had kind of left the stamping technique on the back backburner because of my experience in university and I just thought well this is a nice opportunity to bring it back and amazingly I got selected as the top 40 and I remember getting that email and just kind of losing my mind and that affirmation and that accolade of you know out painting or I don't know what you would call it a thousand eight hundred artists made me feel I had something that I could work with and from there I just produced this huge body of work using the stamp technique and at that time there was a sense of confidence instilled in me and I started approaching galleries and using this kind of provenance of the the art competition to kind of market myself. At the time, I had joined up with Hout Bay Gallery. They were one of the first galleries to take me on and there's definitely a sense of loyalty there, but I wasn't doing the stamp paintings with them till the SPI. And then I joined State of the Art Gallery. And then from there, the ball kept on rolling and things got better and I started selling a bit more regularly and I understood I had something I could work with and sell. You know, being a portrait artist, the struggle is accessibility. No one really wants to live with a stranger's face in their apartment or house. So it's finding a way to make it abstract enough or kind of shift the emphasis of the the person you're painting to either the technique or to any other type of meaning behind it. And I think the stamp technique afforded me that because I love portrait Jedi, something I never really want to abandon. And then one day I had a huge break. I was in my studio. A Shal Bezeta note from World Art Gallery came in to look at another artist's work. And I made my best to kind of get his attention. Um, he saw the work I had and I kind of punted it as best as I could. And then two days later, I get a call from him saying he wants to put me in the turbine art fair. And the pressure was on. I knew I wanted a great product. I just knew I had to do a good job. I had to have it be successful as I really, really respected his gallery and I really knew this was a huge career opportunity. And it all paid off. That was a very successful fair and our relationship has grown ever since. And it's just amazing how it's come full circle where artists like Kilmany Joe Liversage um, were huge inspirations for me in university. I would even wrote and written a paper about her and here I am exhibiting alongside with her in the same gallery. So that was a very proud achievement. And I also learned while working at Studio 41 how important it was for me to be involved with an artist studio and how that discipline um, or that need to go in Monday to Friday, nine to five, was so important in terms of work ethic, about feeling professional and feeling grown up in a way. Because I always felt, you know, I'd, I didn't want to be wishy-washy. I didn't want to be that kind of stereotype of, I think, how many people perceive art. I wanted to be professional and I wanted to make this my career and I learned very quickly that there is definitely freedom and discipline and the more d disciplined I was the more freedom it seemed I had. So yeah I mean studio life was always important to me and also just kind of being alone in a new city it was nice to have peers and a community around me being able to have fresh eyes and fresh ears and fresh opinions and then also the kind of being an artist it feels like being on an island 
there are times when you do experience failures and that failure falls completely on your shoulders. Unlike a film team where if there is a failure, you know, the blame can go all around. But um, as an artist, you feel you have to carry that burden. And I think having an art community around you kind of relieves a bit of that pressure. And so I was in Studio 41 for about um, a year and a half. And unfortunately, due to some decisions, the studio had to close, um, leaving a lot of artists stranded. And what we ended up doing was just being proactive with the, with the situation. And we kind of huddled together and we started our own studio together, which was an amazing learning experience, but exhilarating and absolutely one of the best times in my life. Um, and definitely a lot of learning curves. And I think at first we were just so proud and excited. I think we were doing more parting um, than working. But eventually the dust settled and we kind of got into a routine and rhythm and it served me very well and it was also just important for me as an artist to kind of branch out you know I would kind of introduce myself as a fine artist and co-founder of Untitled Studios that branching out just gave a bit felt it gave a bit more weight to my name and to my responsibility and my I think it altered the impression people had of me and then again because it was a group made studio sometimes when you have too many chefs things can go a bit array and I just found felt it was time for my for myself to leave and luckily at that same time, space opened up at Eastside Studios, which I was very excited about. Also very intimidated at the time. Well, the artists within the space were well accomplished, um, very professional, um, a lot older than me, but I just felt this is the kind of influence I needed in my life. And it served me extremely well. And it was just nice to be in a new, fresh environment around artists I wasn't too familiar with or personally familiar with and just see how that influenced me. And then, yeah, within a year, and a half of being there um, the manager or the leaseholder was leaving and offered me the position and I just jumped on board full-heartedly and it wasn't there was no um, financial incentive it's not run as a profitable um, organization or creative collective but for me knowing the importance of what the studio meant to me in terms of my career and my painting process I just wanted to be the curator of that space and I understood what it needed and what it didn't and what's important. And yeah, so over the years, it's been great evolving and growing it and turning it into this very constructive artist studio. And I'm very proud of that kind of achievement and that position I hold. And again, I introduce myself as the fine artist and also manager of Eastside Studios. And then again, I just felt I've always tried to balance my creative life and my business life. And I think for artists, it's extremely important. I think more and more so the career artist is becoming a thing. Growing up, being around artists, that wasn't a very common thing. A lot of artists I knew growing up either had teaching posts or they had some other career and art was kind of shared with at their time was shared with their other career but I think now so you have like full-time artists so there's a certain responsibility and time needed to kind of cultivate that and sustain that and I found myself you know needing to run the studio get involved with projects do a lot of writing into genres such as street art and kind of expand and expand my venture and it also ultimately just ends up feeding your your creative process and the art you make and I mean when the podcast came around or the position was offered to me I there was no hesitation it's something I always hungered for and it's something I want to grow and hopefully it turns into something magical and it's just great to talk about visual arts I mean I might have of push the commercial aspect and how important it is to have business senses being a fine artist but I do find myself needing that creative process and when, I find, when I'm not painting there's a part of me that feels empty or something is missing and every time I go on holiday and I go back to the studio there's this huge relief and it's, it's just the kind of confirmation that this is where I want to be and this is what I want to do. Another thing for me was learning that time spent outside the studio can be just as constructive 
And I mean, even going overseas in 2017, my first time overseas, it was a huge investment in terms of time and cash, but ultimately so rewarding. I think those experiences just feed the creative process, even if it's not direct influences. Like, yes, I did see galleries and I saw museums and I saw amazing architecture, but just experience, uh, experiencing different culture, different food, different ways of thinking, different ways of seeing, that all ultimately kind of gives you a bit more maturity and then ultimately makes your work a lot more mature. And then again, yeah, just broadening to an international market. I just thought if I'm overseas, just try and tap into a gallery. And while I was in Europe and specifically Germany, I did a a short two week residency there with an artist I met in South Africa two years prior and built a body of work and then just scrambled to try and find a gallery to take me on board and then through some connections and through my wife's uh, father he lined me up with a gallery called Artco. We had a meeting it turned out very successful and yeah it was just great being part of the international art community and they just had extremely methodical strategies in terms of promoting and investing in their artists and it has been great being a part of um, numerous art fairs and hopefully publications to come but yeah again never would have happened if i didn't decide to go overseas um, yeah, and then within the that same time period, coming back and just feeling fulfilled in many ways and doing the whole trip with my partner, my girlfriend at the time, I just felt like I wanted a bit more responsibility and I wanted uh, more commitment in my life and I ended up proposing to her and in December of 2018 we got married and very happily <laughs> married I am. And it's just nice to have a partner. It's great that she herself is also an art teacher, or she's an art teacher, but we both artists and we both in the art world. And that connection really makes the bond stronger and we can always just after work chat about kind of our our days and the, the artistic struggles we dealt with and so forth. And especially in this kind of field of work, I definitely find support and teamwork and friendship so important. The art community definitely needs, again, just saying, you know, being an artist is an island and it's just nice to kind of build those bridges and extend and expand because I think ultimately it's it's an ecosystem and the people you surround yourself with ultimately influence what you do and who you are and it's just good to position yourself amongst constructive, um, professional, exciting, enthusiastic people as ultimately you feed off that. And yeah, I mean, hopefully through this podcast, I meet a lot more creatives. I'm planning to cover all genres of visual arts from tattoo artists to framers to curators to fine artists to graffiti artists Um, and just expand and just kind of try and make the community bigger and brighter and healthier and happier and just giving people exposure to all these different and beautiful genres of art. So catch me next time where I'll have a guest and it will be a lot less pressure on me talking about myself. But yeah. Thank you very much for listening. ArtPod is a South African-focused visual arts podcast hosted by Claude Chandler and produced by the generous assistance of Blended Podcasts brought to you by Blended Audio. 